Good morning. Good to see all of you here braving the elements and you set your alarm clocks correctly. So we succeeded. It's good to be together. We believe that no matter where you are or who you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. And so we are delighted to be together. Uh, today we have a great day planned. Uh, following worship, you can come downstairs for coffee hour and fellowship, and there's a wonderful bake sale going on. And then in the afternoon, uh, Peter is going to share a concert with us. Peter is a phenomenal organist, and he is going to be playing for us. So I invite you to come back at 4 o'clock to um, enjoy the music. Um, and then tonight, if you are interested in membership in our uh, church and uh, interested in learning more about it, uh, we have membership class that starts at 7 today. Um, we are selling Lenten devotionals. Uh, they are $5. Um, they will be downstairs following worship if you're interested. Also, this week is dinner church. This is a really good time. If you're interested in deepening your faith or really learning more about scripture, more about uh, the words that we say in scripture, um, I invite you to come. It's a very low-key, uh, community-oriented dinner and time to dis discuss the scripture lessons. And then on the 24th, um, I invite you to really mark that down. The Green Team and the Mission and Social Action uh, Board are putting together a forum. It's going to be held up in room 207, and it's called What Kind of Planet We Want to Live On. And it's really a dialogue to be able to talk about how do we care for our planet? What kind of stewards are we for our planet and our Earth? So I invite you to mark your calendar and plan to come, and they invite you to sign up um, in the narthex to attend to that. And at this time, let us join in worship. Please join me in the call to worship. Today we begin our journey of Lent, a journey of following Christ into the desert and then into Jerusalem. We join remembering the challenges of the Israelites as they journeyed away from slavery through the desert towards a new beginning. join in the journey together towards justice, wholeness, and peace. Please. Please join me in the prayer of invocation. Gracious God, too often we shut the windows and the doors of our heart and we don't allow you to enter. Too often we forget to share in your joy and the delightful moments around us. We turn to you during times of trouble and yet forget you when life is going well. Forgive us, God, and allow us to experience your presence here and now. And now we pray as Jesus taught us, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
invite the children to come forward for this morning's children's sermon. And if you have a prayer request that you would like included in our pastoral prayer, to please write it on a prayer slip, pass it to the aisle, and a deacon will come and pick them up for you. Good morning. Hey, boys, move over a little bit. You want to see the pictures, don't you? You know, we're in the season of Lent, and today I want to talk to you about temptation. Temptation is wanting to do, oh, come on up, have a seat. You want to see the pictures of the book, don't you? Come on. It's okay. Sit right here. Sit right there. And temptation is, you can sit right next to me. Temptation is wanting to do something or wanting to have something you shouldn't and that's something that even Jesus was tempted. And he made all the right decisions, so he would, so he did good, and that's what we have to learn to do, is make the right decision. Well, I found a children's book, and it's too bad the grown-ups aren't gonna see the pictures, because it's a really cute story I read to my granddaughter. It's called The Love Monster. Do you? This monster it was just getting back from vacation. And although it was a little bit exciting to be home, he was sad to leave his adventure behind. You see? Yeah. But wait, what was this? A box of chocolates just sitting there, waiting to be found? Not you find? He's a cute little monster, isn't he? Yes, the love monster couldn't believe it. Everybody knows that a monster loves chocolate, especially this monster. <laughs> His mouth started to water just thinking about what might be inside. Perhaps a peanut butter crunch, or maybe, just maybe, his favorite, a double chocolate strawberry swirl. That's the monster's very favorite. Well, what if someone, oh, wait, I skipped the page, didn't I? Okay, just then he had a thought. He just couldn't think. He just probably shouldn't share the chocolates with his friends, but what if there wasn't enough? Okay, he was afraid. He wanted them all, didn't he, huh? Or what if someone took the one he wanted most? Or... Worst of all, what if the only one left was the coffee one? Ew! Everybody knows the monster hates those, especially this monster. Well, I'm sorry to tell you, after thinking all these thoughts, the love monster decided it'd be safer and kinder for everyone if he kept the chocolates just for himself. And, whoop, all my papers are falling off. So he went into the house, and so did with the box of chocolates, without a whisper or a word to anyone. He took the whole box inside. Oh. Oh. Love monster couldn't wait. Oh, how his mouth watered. But it was just as he went to lift the lid, a sort of queasy, squeezy feeling in his heart. I was, it was the feeling the monster, it was the feeling a monster gets to know when he's about to do something he shouldn't do. He's gonna eat all those chocolates by himself. And before you could say, pass me the truffle surprise, he burst out of the house. He ran as fast as he could on his toes would carry him to find his friends. We all know why, huh? And when he did, and then out of breath and a bit out of shouty voice, he said, I got back from my vacation and I found some chocolates. I was going to keep them all to myself. But then I realized I wanted to share them with you. And I don't even want a single one. Well, maybe one. Do you see? 
made the right decision. And you know what his friend said? Silly monster, just open the box. Are you ready? <gasps> to love monster, we missed you so much, we saved our last chocolate, your favorite, because you're one of our favorite monsters. But see, the story about this story tells you how the monster was tempted to eat all those candies by himself. But because he shared them with his friends, he felt so much better inside. And that's what we have to learn from this, okay? Let us pray. Father, we know that we will be tempted, but we pray for your help and strength to resist temptation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. Okay. The Old Testament reasoning this morning comes from Deuteronomy, chapter 26, verses 1 through 11. When you have come into the land of the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess, and you possess it, and settle it in, and you shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground which you harvest from the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you shall put it in a basket and go to the place that your Lord will choose as a dwelling for his name. You shall go to the priest who is in office at the time and say to him, Today I declare to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our ancestors to give us. And when the priest takes the basket from your hand and sets it down before the altar of the Lord your God, you shall make this response before the Lord your God. A wandering Aramean was my ancestor. He went down into Egypt and lived there as an alien. Few in number, and there he became a great nation, mighty and prosperous. When the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us by imposing hard labor on us, we cried to the Lord, the God of our ancestors. The Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. 
The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. With a terrifying display of power and with signs and wonders, he brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground that you, O Lord, have given me. You shall set it down before the Lord your God and bow down before the Lord. Then you, together with the Levites and the aliens who reside among you, shall celebrate with all the bounty that the Lord your God has given to you and to your house. The Gospel reading comes from the book of Luke, chapter 4, 1 through 13. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to come, become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, one does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle at the, of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time.
gather this morning on the first Sunday of Lent. And as I said in my newsletter article this, uh, this month, season, Lent is the season that we metaphorically travel to the cross and then ultimately to the empty tomb. And one of the pit stops along the way is self-reflection. Now typically I don't mind this at first, but as soon as I encounter something in me that I don't like or something that I should change or perhaps do differently, and if I have to change my behavior in some way, then I quickly wonder who has time for all this self-reflection anyway, you know? <laughs> well, as we begin the journey of Lent, we often read what we read this morning in Scripture about the temptations of Jesus where Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days. It says that for 40 days, Jesus did not eat. I mean, can you imagine? I know, no way. Um, there'd be no BLTs, no french fries, no blueberries on his cereal in the morning, no fresh veggies, no ice cream before bed. I mean, if it was me, I would be a little cranky. Perhaps Jesus was a little bit on edge, too. I mean, we have to imagine that he physically felt the hunger pains in his body, that he was somewhat at least uncomfortable. Yet he didn't panic, and he remained true to who he was. The scripture says that he was famished, and it was while he was famished that the devil came to him and said, you know, if you are really the son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Again, if it was me, I would have thought, you know, that's not a bad idea. That would solve a lot of problems. I love bread, especially when I'm hungry. But Jesus said, one does not live by bread alone. Jesus was clear with who he was and what he was about. Then the devil tried again. And showing him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world, the devil said to him, to you I will give their glory and all this authority. If only you worship, worship me, it will all be yours. I mean, the devil was giving him position of power. Jesus would have been the man. I mean, he could have had anything that he wanted. But yet again, he was clear in who he was and who he belonged to and said, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Well, the devil was persistent and took Jesus up onto a high cliff and said, if your God is so great, then just throw yourself off and allow God to save you. Allow God to protect you. Jesus responded, don't put the Lord your God to test. That's not how it works. I mean, the devil was using every avenue possible trying to pull Jesus away from who he was. He was seducing him with food. He was seducing him with power, with safety, trying to wean him away from who he was. In a sense, he was trying to steal his identity. I mean, that's the way it is with temptation. Temptation, it's not so much um, toward something, usually portrayed as something you shouldn't do, like I shouldn't have that piece of cake, but rather temptation pulls us away from something, namely our relationship with God and the identity received, we receive through that relationship. The devil tried to undermine Jesus' belief in both himself and in God. He was trying to erode Jesus' confidence by insinuating that Jesus was not enough, that he was not secure, that he was not worthy of God's love. Yet in the face of these temptations, Jesus quotes the sacred story of the people of Israel. 
He does so to assert that he is a part of that story and therefore reaffirms his identity as a child of God and rooted in scriptures, Jesus is reminded not only that he is enough and that he has infinite worth in the eyes of God. Bread, power, and safety is what the devil used to tempt Jesus. But it might as well have been youth, beauty, and wealth, or confidence, fame, and security. On one level, we all experience specific temptations in concrete ways. But on another, they are all the same. And they shift, they try to shift our allegiance and our trust and our confidence away from God and towards some substitute that promises a more secure identity. Which is why I think this passage is really about identity theft. The temptations steal our identity away from who we really are. In a world that revolves around money, it's easy to think that more money, that the more money we have, the happier we'll be. If we have enough money, then we won't have any problems. Well, there's a recent article by the commissioner of the NBA, the National Basketball Association, that I found fascinating. This isn't my normal reading material. Uh, my husband found it and thought I would appreciate it. And in it, the commissioner said that they, the NBA, are having more and more problems with players. These players who presumably are doing what they love, playing basketball at a very high level and getting paid millions and millions of dollars for it. These players are having more and more problems with anxiety and depression. The commissioner believes that a major reason for this is because of social media. They they can't, the players are not able to live up to all the hype. The expectations they experience are beyond what they can deliver. They are expected to have phenomenal plays, like top 10 plays, every single game. Now, I'm not really feeling sorry for the basketball players, but it shows the pressure that they are under. The pressure to live up to an image. And I'm afraid there's a trickle-down effect. So many of us and so many of our young people have expectations that we cannot live up to. And in a sense, we get lost and we find ourselves discouraged and disconnected. The other thing that these professional basketball players struggle with is loneliness. They get on the bus, and they immediately put in their head earbuds or they put on their headphones and they're isolated. It used to be that bus rides were an opportunity for players to bond, to create community, but no longer. So instead, they are isolated and lonely. I fear that this happens too much in our society. We are disconnected. We are pulled in all these different directions with all kinds of expectations, and we don't know where we belong. Now, three years ago, I came out of the Monday Thursday worship service. After cleaning up and turning off the lights, I went into my office to get my pocketbook and my phone, and I grabbed my phone, and I looked at my phone, and my stomach got this huge pit in it. Because on my phone, I had battery, but I had no service. My phone was disconnected. And I knew exactly what happened because it had happened three weeks prior. Somebody stole my identity. And they went in and got a phone and got onto my line in some funky, amazing way that they could do it. And if any of you have experienced identity theft, you know that it can be a major headache. It happened not to me, but also my sons, Somehow my husband and my daughter were, you know, were saved and didn't have to go through it, but the three of us did, and it happened two times. 
First, I was disgusted how anybody really could pretend to be somebody that they're not. How can someone knowingly take something that's not theirs? Then I felt violated that nothing is safe. And I was disgusted with whoever did this and wanted some explanation from the cell phone company on how it happened not only once but twice. I was, needless to say, very angry. And then it made me in a really good mood to prepare for that Easter sunrise or Easter, you know, Easter service, you know. Well, let me tell you that we took precautions to make sure that this would never happen again. We have the top-notch security on our phones. But it makes me wonder, what do we do to protect our identity as children of God? I mean, consider the media barrage of advertising to which most of us are so regularly subjected. Nine times out of ten, the goal of such ads is to create in us a sense of lack or of inadequacy, followed by the implicit promise that purchasing the advertised product will relieve our insecurity. We are under assault every single day by tempting messages that seek to draw our allegiance away from God, to draw our allegiance away from the one who created us and who redeemed us towards some meager substitute. We face temptations every single day. We have these voices telling us, you know, it doesn't really matter if you reuse or recycle. You know, is one plastic bottle really going to make a difference? Or it doesn't matter if you donate money to the needy. You know, maybe I just need to keep it for myself because I may need it someday. Or it doesn't matter if you volunteer, someone else can always do it. We are tempted to bend our ethics of what is right or justify our behavior. And then pretty soon we are lost and we are disconnected and we don't know how to make things right. So we come today to be reminded, to be reminded that we are beloved children of God, that God forgives us, and loves us more than anything. God loves all of us, young and old, male and female, black, white, brown, pink. God loves the wealthy and the poor, whatever your so sexual orientation is. God loves us enough to send God's only son into the world to take on our lot and life, to suffer the same temptations and wants, to be rejected as we often feel rejected, and to die as we will die, so that we may know that God is with us now and forever. God raised Jesus from the dead in order to demonstrate that God's love is more powerful than all the hate in this world. And that life offers us, the life that God offers us, is more powerful even than death. We are tempted in manifold ways to lose our faith in God and confidence in ourselves. Yet we come to church. We come to church to be reminded of our identity as beloved children of God. And in the face of so many assaults on our identity, we come to have our identity renewed and restored that we might live in the confidence of God's abundant life and to share this love with those around us. And so to help you remember today that you are a beloved child of God, we have created some identified... Uh, Christian identification cards. So we've asked some of the deacons and the ushers to come forward and to pass these out. And this is a card to remind you that you are a beloved child of God, that you are cherished, you are known, you are forgiven, and you are accepted just as you are. You can carry this with you to remind yourself who you are and whose you are.
where we all have very uh, experienced lots of temptations that steal our identity. So my prayer today is that we will know beyond a shadow of a doubt who we are, that we are beloved children of God. Amen. <coughs> Let us pray. Let us take a moment of silence to bring those things that are in our hearts that we want to share with God, our only God, and then I will close us in prayer. Gracious, gracious God, gracious Lord Jesus, we give you thanks that we can identify as your beloved children. We give you thanks, Lord, for so many blessings on our lives. We give you thanks, Lord Jesus, for the privilege to be in this sacred space this day, to worship you, to pray, to hear your word, to be open to new ways of being your beloved community. We are grateful. We are grateful that we can come to you with all our burdens. We can leave them here knowing, oh God, that you are listening, that you will provide an answer when needed. You will heal our bodies. You will Free us from captivity. You will, O oh God, shower us with your infinite love and your grace. We are indeed grateful. We give you thanks for the ways in which you move in our lives, in the way that you speak to our hearts, in the way the Holy Spirit directs us each and every day. We are grateful for this community of faith where we are a family, where we could come each Sunday morning and worship you freely. We can come during the week and be part of many activities that are going on in this place. We give you thanks, Lord, for all the leadership of this congregation. We give you thanks, oh God, for the staff and for all the people that make things happen in this place. We give you thanks. And now we ask you, oh God, to be with those who feel lonely and feel heartbroken this morning, that you will be with them, that you will comfort them, oh God. We ask you, oh God, to be with those who are sh shut-ins this morning, that are hoping and will, and desiring to be in a sacred space that they may also be fed, oh God. We ask you, oh God, to be with those who are addicted to opiates and drugs. We ask you, oh God, to touch their hearts. Be with them, oh God, that they may know that there's a God who loves them and cares about them. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for all that you are for us. And now we ask you, O oh God, to listen to the people's prayers. Please pray for a cousin who is suffering with stomach cancer and her family. We pray for our friend, Kate McNulty, for lessened pain. May she feel our love and prayer surrounding her. Prayers for Barbara, whose, face, whose father, 93-year-old, died this week for young parents trying to do it all. Allow them to accept your help and the people you bring into their lives with words of wisdom. For our beloved grandmother who is recovering in the hospital from fainting. 
safe travels for all journeys. For Jane Berkeley, recovering from cardiac surgery. For Vinnie and Anne Marie de Pentema, both recovering from the flu. Jim, whose test for kidney disease. We also ask for prayers for the families of those who lost their lives in a plane that went down, went down as it left Ethiopia this morning. We ask you, O oh God, to hear our prayers and ask you to respond to each and every need according to your will. And we know, O oh God, that we are your people and that you are our God. And for that, we are grateful. We ask these things in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Sharon Christman uh, from the Interval House lives in Ellington and was not comfortable driving down here this morning. So we will invite her. She's from the Interval House. We will invite her another Sunday to come and join us. So we move into the part in our program that says the right of fellowship. This is a time when we greet one another with the peace of Christ. We welcome those we know, those that we don't know. And as I was thinking about that this week, I thought, you know, how often do we really get to look at somebody and wish them a sense of peace? How often do your, during your week do you get to do this? And some liturgical traditions, they say, you know, the peace of Christ be with you, and the people say, and it's also with you. Um, so it's really a sense of wishing peace to one another, and I just think it's such a wonderful gift to be able to take this moment to wish peace to those around us. So at this time, I invite you to stand and wish peace to those people around you. now receive this morning's offering.
Dear Lord, as we are in the season of Lent, let us reflect on our lives. May we remember this faithful journey we are on together as Christians, and may our faith in gracious God be always strong. Accept these offerings we give today, but also bless our acts of kindness we do in, our, in your name, not just here, but in the world around us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. and as the community of faith. We have greeted one another, we have laughed, we have hugged, and if you notice on our communion table, we have some Lenten candles. These candles have been lit, but over the next six, six weeks, the light will slowly fade into darkness. We do this not to be morbid, but because in the story of Jesus' death and re resurrection, God is revealed. God is revealed in the amazing transformation of death into life, and in endings transformed into new beginnings, and in dead ends that become a source of new possibilities. This is the sacred center of our faith, the truth made manifest in Jesus Christ, in his pain and his suffering, Jesus speaks to every pain and loss that we have endured and offers you the power of transformation. It's an old, old story, but it still has the power to reveal, to heal, and to redeem. Jesus is at the heart of our faith, in the depth of our souls, and he is waiting for us inviting us to follow along with him on this journey that brought him to the cross. Jesus is calling us to follow. And so today, we extinguish the first candle. We extinguish the first candle, and we acknowledge that the darkness and pain of injustice in the world is real and true. Let us pray. Loving God, as we journey through this holy season of Lent, give us strength 
and courage to make the changes that are needed in our lives. Open our hearts and our minds to your steadfast presence and help us to put our trust in you. Amen.